For the final interview of the afternoon, I had the pleasure of speaking with former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates. He served under both Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama and is the only Secretary of Defense in U.S. history to be asked to remain in the office by a newly elected president. Throughout our expansive interview, we discuss how Russia's invasion of Ukraine acted as a wake-up call, why global affairs matter to the American people, the evolution of cyber threats, and so much more. It's a conversation you won't want to miss. It's a great cap to a marathon day. Uh, let's take a listen. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for joining us today. Look, I want to get right at it. Uh, the world is bleeding, and we're watching this horrible, um, horrible situation uh, in Ukraine with the invasion by Russian Vladimir Putin. I guess, you know, just a few months ago, this administration, the Biden administration, was talking about the pivot to Asia. And I'm just wondering, as you know, you sort of look at, you know, the questions of how we manage our interests geostrategically in the world, did we set this up so that Vladimir Putin could kind of mock America and say, oh, remember us over here? And I'd just be interested to get your insights as we frame what America is about, as we frame what the challenges are. Did we make a mistake by talking so much about Asia and taking our eye off the ball in Europe? I think that uh, people kind of fell asleep at the switch in terms of uh, the fact that the world beyond China uh, continues to represent a uh, national security threat uh, to the United States and, and to our allies. And it's not just Europe uh, and Russia, it's the Middle East, it's uh, North Korea, uh, and, and while, you know, for the last several administrations have talked more about China and, and the need beginning in the Obama administration to uh, pivot to China, the reality is we still face global challenges. And, and what, what I think uh, the invasion of Ukraine represents is a wake up call, or as I put it in a recent op-ed, a cold shower. That's a reminder of the kind of regime we have in Moscow uh, and, and as we see the continuing attacks uh, out, of, out of Yemen onto Saudi Arabia and the UAE, um, uh, Iran's continued meddling, these, these are, we still face problems around the world. Now, I think uh, the, the important thing to, uh, to bear in mind is that what Putin has done is remind us that for the first time since World War II, we face powerful adversaries in both Europe and Asia. So we can't just have a, a, an Asia strategy, a China strategy. We have to have a global strategy in terms of the role of the United States uh, around the world. And, and we have to have the capacity to deal with a world in which we have uh, that kind of uh, powerful uh, adversary. So, so I think while China is truly a long-term challenge in my view, because you've had multiple leaders, uh, really beginning with Deng Xiaoping, who, who have wanted to see China grow and become more powerful and economically richer uh, as a way of competing with the United States and, and reasserting their role in the world as a great power. Um, I think, I hope that we may have a one man problem in Putin, that we might see a, a different kind of Russia after Putin and particularly after the catastrophe that he's led the country into at this point. Well, I think it's a very interesting point and you know, I would tell our viewers that you had a very powerful and thoughtful op-ed in the Washington Post that said, you know, Dmitry Medvedev was a very different kind of guy. You're not predicting that that's necessarily what may come after Putin. But you said very clearly the case with China is different, that the grooves of leadership, whether it's Xi Jinping or his successors eventually, that the groove of China is a different kind of long-term challenge to the United States. What were the distinctions you were trying to make there? Well, first of all, that China does remain the primary long-term challenge to the United States. Uh, I, think, I think Russia will be a serious challenge to the United States primarily as long as Putin is there. There is at least some hope that he, or that he, once he passes from the scene, that his successor or that person's successor, there may be some kind of intermediate uh, regime of some kind, but, but we, we can anticipate the possibility at least of Russia taking a very different turn post Putin. Mm -hmm and wanting to reintegrate with the West, wanting to have, diversify its economy and so on. 
um, because you really have just this last 20 years of Putin uh, as, as an adversary, if you will, uh, whereas you've got, as you suggested, multiple Chinese leaders, really all the way from Deng Xiaoping to the present, uh, who have essentially followed the same strategy. Now, now, what was characteristic of Deng Xiaoping uh, and his successors up to Xi was a willingness to take a, a, a less openly adversarial role with the US and the West, a, a, a less wolf warrior uh, diplomatic approach, if you will, to use their term. And, to, and as, as, as Dung would put it, to, to hide their strength and bide their time. She's decided it's time to stop hiding and biding and time to come out and basically uh, aggressively assert what his predecessors were building toward. And, and I think that his successors uh, will probably, they, they may change tactics and, and be a little less aggressive or assertive, but, but China I think is a long-term rival. But we can't just have a strategy that focuses on China. These other challenges are very real, as the Ukrainians will tell us. And as, as our allies, uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia will tell us. So we need a global strategy. And because it's a global strategy, we need to look at, at our instruments of national security, both military and non-military, in a different way. Look, this is oversimplifying things by far, and I know that, but there used to be this adage that politics ended at water's edge. But today, politics don't even end at party's edge, that you have uh, you know, great divides, frankly, in both parties, not just the Republican Party, about America's purpose in the world, about what our equities are out there. And, and I guess my question to you as you look forward, what's not being communicated or what counsel would you give President Biden on sort of making the case about why Ukraine matters, why global engagement matters. I think a lot of Americans out there were frustrated and voted for President Trump because they sort of felt like they fought the Cold War and they felt like China won. They saw their jobs shipped off to different places. So how do you get back and kind of redo that grand deal for Americans who right now are ambivalent about our U.S. foreign policy? Well, I think uh, I like to point out to people that Xi Jinping has done something that no living person, no other living person has done, and that is bring Republicans and Democrats together on the Hill. Uh, <laughs> from the far left to the far right, they're all competing with each other to see who can be tougher on China. And Vladimir Putin now has done the same thing. So you find very hawkish views on the Hill across the political spectrum on both Russia and China. So this is a foundation of bipartisanship that actually the president has the potential to build on. And, and Franklin D. Roosevelt once said that the principal purpose of the, of the statesman is to educate. And I think that, that what, what the administration needs to do, what the president needs to do is, is devote more time to explaining to Americans why Ukraine matters, why the United States has to be engaged in the world, but he has to do it in terms that everyday Americans understand why it affects their pocketbook, why it affair, uh, affects their daily lives. Look, the price of grain, the price of food is going up because 30% of the grain and, and uh, uh, in, the, in the world, uh, wheat and barley and so on, and corn comes out of Ukraine and Russia. So the price in your Kroger or in your supermarket is going to go up in no small part because of, of what's happening in Asia. The reason you're paying as much as you are at the, at the gas pump in many respects is not just inflation. It has to do with the demand and expectations globally. President needs to explain these pocketbook issues about why these things matter, mm -hmm. why developments in remote places around the world affect Americans and the role we have. And he has to explain how we can have a leadership role in the world without being the world policeman and without fighting long-term wars to try and change other countries. You know, one of the things that you did when you were Secretary of Defense was highly unusual. And that was you were saying, please fund the State Department, please fund our diplomacy, please fund these other functions of diplomacy that Congress kept giving money to the Pentagon to do. Um, in your article in the Post, you say, we need to resurrect and refocus and repurpose uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, and the U.S. Information Agency, USIA, which got merged kind of into the State Department at one point. I'd love to hear more about that, because when you think about China and its place in the world, 
you hear about the Belt and Road Initiative. They've got a little, you know, you got a bumper sticker for what they're doing. And I don't know whether many places in the world have the same sense of American presence in global affairs, even though I know we're there. But you're saying we need to kind of clean that act up. Can you tell us a little more? Well, these agencies, international, the international, uh, the a Agency for International Development, uh, USIA, uh, other agencies played a critical role in the Cold War uh, in terms of strategic communications, in terms of humanitarian and development assistance. Uh, we, we had a lot of friends around the world because of those capabilities. There are a lot of people that were willing to work with us. Congress dismantled, uh, eliminated USIA in 1998, turned that around in the early 2000s. Hu Jintao, Xi Jinping's predecessor, invested $7 billion in building a strategic communications capability for China that now has global reach, radio networks, television networks, educational institutions, Confucius Institutes, all these kinds of things. Chinese language newspapers all over the world are owned by the Chinese. So, so they have this very sophisticated, very uh, large capability and we basically crippled our capability in that arena. Uh, when I left the government in uh, 1993, when I retired as CIA director, USIA had 16,000 employees deployed around the world in, in developing countries, incredibly dedicated people. 13 years later, when I came back into government, AID had 3,000 employees and they were all managing mm -hmm. contractors. So, and, and now we have Belt and Road and, and the Chinese spending huge sums of money. Where is the new strategy for how you, how do you compete with that? How do you incentivize, how do you get a public private partnership that incentivizes our private sector, which has, is the only thing that has the capacity to begin to compete with the Chinese in this arena? How do we incentivize them into doing infrastructure projects uh, in, in various places? And these things have real consequence. China is now the largest trading partner with virtually every country in Latin America. They have, they have much greater trading relationships with most of the countries in Africa. They're building relationships throughout the Middle East. So this is about influence, but it's also about markets and, and trade. And we're losing out because we have the, the, these capabilities in diplomacy and in international economic affairs in development assistance and so on. And that's the part of our government that played such an important role in the Cold War that we need to rebuild and, and fund adequately. You know, as, as Jim Mattis said when he was Secretary of Defense, if you don't fund the Defense Department, uh, the, if you don't fund the State Department properly, I'm gonna have to buy more ammunition. Hmm. That's the heart of it. Well, let me ask you, I had an interview the other day with Francis Fukuyama, as you know, he started his career as I did at the RAND UCLA Soviet Center. You know, we were Soviet watchers back then. And then that business went out of business. There weren't a lot of people uh, that, that, you know, were, you know, the high priests of foreign policy, national security were all Soviet watchers. That went away. And he made an interesting point. He said, we have a generation, maybe even two, that have no experience with the real um, knife edge feeling of the Cold War, the con sense of consequence and competition in the world. And that maybe this disaster in Ukraine will give people a visible and tangible understanding of what fighting for freedom, fighting for democracy feels like and kind of instill in them why some of these issues in global engagement are important. I'd love to get your thoughts because we have a lot of debates in this country right now about how far America should go, what, are the, what makes us um, the NATO um, alliance solvent, what are lines we shouldn't cross. And we'd love to just get your counsel as we're in this key moment uh, is America doing it right right now? Are we being too timid? Are we sending the right signals? Well, I think, I think that the policy that we're pursuing with respect to Ukraine right now is pretty much on the mark. Uh, it, I think there, I, I could make an argument on how we could have provided and should have provided more assistance to Ukraine earlier, nor military mm -hmm. assistance earlier. Mm -hmm. But I think that particularly in the lead, since last fall, I think the administration's approach has been pretty much on target. I think the diplomacy has been inspired. The last time a president was able to assemble this kind of, of a cohesive uh, alliance effort was George H.W. Bush in the first Gulf War. Uh, so I think the diplomacy has been successful. I think the amount of supplies going in 
uh, to Ukraine is really pretty extraordinary at this point, uh, and not just coming from the United States, but from all over uh, Europe and, and elsewhere. And, and so I think it's hard to second guess uh, what they're doing now. And I think, I think that they're striking the right balance in terms of what we won't do. Uh, I think they should stop talking about what we won't do, but but I think I think they made the right decision on the Polish MIGs. I, I think that there is real concern that that Putin is going to use chemical weapons or might even use a tactical nuclear weapon. So I think that they're treading as carefully as they can while still providing a great deal of assistance to Ukraine. But there is a real threat out there, and and you know as people particularly on the Hill, try to out-hawk each other. Uh, the president's got the responsibility for preventing a major war between the United States and Russia over Ukraine. So how do you balance supporting the Ukrainians in every way we can that makes sense while avoiding a war uh, with Russia? And I think they're treading that path, thre threading that needle uh, pretty well at this point. But, but I think that... If, the, again, I think that the important, the only thing that I would say is missing is more conversation with the American people about why it matters and about why our leadership matters. And I think what this conflict has shown is it's demonstrated to everybody the, the, the value of the one asset we have that China does not have, and that is allies. And the fact that we can assemble so many countries in support of what we think is the right thing to do is pretty remarkable. You know, I, I'm taking this a little bit further, longer than I think my folks counted on, but I'm gonna do it. You wrote the commanders, you've been intimate with um, the people who were the great national security architects of America's interests in the world. I think all the way, you know, the, you know from the Dean Atchison's in one, one era to the Scowcrofts and Brzezinski's in another, yourself included. I'd just be interested when I kind of look at people like that, Bill Burns, who's now director of the CIA, I think is extremely um, uh, thoughtful and, and whatever, but I don't see the kind of same um, posture, the same presence of national security thinkers and leaders as we saw in previous generations. I'd love to get your insights on that. And do you worry about that? Well, I do. And, and one of the things that I worry about as well, when I stepped down um, in, uh, you know, when I retired as secretary in 2011, I was concerned that I was the last senior national security advisor who had served both re uh, Republican and Democratic presidents, uh, eight of them all together. And, and I would say there, there is an exception to that at this point, <clears throat> and that's Bill Burns, who I have the greatest respect for, and I think he's doing a terrific job. But there aren't many. I mean, right now, Bill is the only one who has served both Republicans and Democrats, and, and I think with distinction, and I'm really glad he's where he is. Um, but it is a concern, and I, and, I, and I worry that the environment in Washington is so poisonous that a lot of young people who might otherwise want to go into public service, go to work for the Defense Department or the State Department or CIA, are deterred from it uh, for fear that uh, they'll just get embroiled in all of the politics. And, 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 and so you won't get that next generation uh, coming up. But most of the people today, uh, including those in senior positions, uh, in national security have either have have pretty much stayed in either a Republican silo or a Democratic silo and uh, in their careers. And the result is uh, you don't have people who have the continuity of experience that can sit down at the table and say, you know, uh, this works and this doesn't work and 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 provide sort of a completely nonpartisan uh, approach and have the credibility with the Congress as being nonpartisan. You know, just finally, Mr. Secretary, I've been waiting for someone really smart or for some classified RAND study to get declassified on the really smart scaffolding of a global cyber doctrine, a military doctrine. And I know we have US Cyber Command, we have stuff out there, but cyber kind of it seems to be the next frontier in terrain. And I'm just, we're such a reactive nation do we need to have a full on cyber war with the Russians or the Chinese or the Iranians to actually begin to put some of the things in place that we need to on cyber? 
Well, I sure hope not. I mean, I created Cyber Command in 2010 uh, to put in place for the Pentagon, at least, uh, the capabilities, both offensive and defensive, that we need. And I think we have the, the technical capabilities. The problem that I see is that you've got DHS, which has uh, statutory responsibility for cyber defense in the United States. You've got a cyber coordinator in the White House. You've got a deputy national security advisor for cyber. Uh, but at the end of the day, who's in charge? What's the command and control? And also the fact that the only real actual resource we have that does that actually does the cyber is the National Security Agency, which reports to the Department of Defense, which has no hmm. statutory authority in the United States to do those kinds of things. And I'm not sure we've figured all that out. I think we have the technical capability. I'm pretty confident of that. But, and, and I do applaud what the administration is doing in terms of trying to get the private sector more engaged in cyber defense and more engaged with the government. Uh, we've done that, I think, extremely well in the financial sector. That's probably the most secure of all of the infrastructure in the United States because they've been working together for a long time. Uh, but in other, other categories, it's really just getting underway. You know, I, one last final one. I know that you and President Biden have not always been on the same page on foreign policy decisions, and you've written about that. Um, and that's often the case with people who you know, work together in this field. If the president reaches out to you, if he hasn't already, are you there to give counsel and advice to him in these tough times? Of course. I mean, anytime somebody back there, back there in Washington, D.C. Uh, thinks I can be of help, I'm always happy to help. I think we all have that obligation. Well, Secretary Robert Gates, what a pleasure. I could talk to you all day, and I really appreciate you very much for this time and sharing us with as we think about the future of defense here at the Hill. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thanks again to Dr. Robert Gates for joining me. That was a great interview. That brings us to the end of our program. A very big thank you to Raytheon Missiles and Defense for its support and to all of you attendees for joining us for this discussion. For any of you who may have missed, missed any of these conversations, video from the event will be up on our website shortly. I'm Steve Clemens. Be well.